Gerard Smithson from GRC 2020 Research. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my role is an analyst. I spent seven years at Forrester Research, where, yes, I guess I got that title, Father in GRC, because on a cold, snowy day in the Chicago office of Forrester, I defined and labeled a market for governance risk and compliance software and labeled it GRC. Uh, and so my job as an analyst is to understand what are the, the challenges that organizations like yours are faced with in the context of governance risk and compliance around the world, and how do you go about addressing those challenges with strategy, process, and technology? So let's first look, I've got like a two-part keynote session with a little break in between. Uh, the first one, we're going to look at the state of GRC in 2023. And one of the things we need to consider is, what does our future look like? Our future here in Saudi Arabia? Our future in a global context? Are we, I'm, a, I'm a science fiction fan, I don't know if you guys like science fiction movies, uh, but we're heading towards one of two futures or somewhere in between. Are we heading towards that future of Blade Runner, where it's an environmental and social dystopia disaster? Are we heading towards that future of Star Trek, where you, you have this future that, that's uh, environmentally friendly and focused on uh, a lot of the uh, you know, cooperation between not just different countries and races, but intergalactic species? You know, we're heading towards some future globally, and what does that future look like? And how does government decisions, but as well as corporate decisions, play into that? But the challenge with organizations today is that managing risk and compliance is what I call navigating chaos. I actually wrote a paper on this for the Institute of Risk Management in London, and I'm happy to send it to anybody as well. But navigating chaos. Regulations are changing. Global financial services firms, just looking at one industry, are dealing with 257 regulatory change events every business day. New laws or regulations, change laws or regulations, enforcement actions. There's 257 regulatory change events every business day in financial services coming from 1,217 regulators around the world. That's a lot of legal and regulatory change. But then you've got change in the risk environment, geopolitical risks, economic risks, uh, shifts in technology, uh, and, and so much more out there. And so we have to keep up with regulatory change and its risks. You have to keep abreast of broader global geopolitical and economic risks and shifts in technology and standards and what's expected. But then you also have change in your business environment. Shifts in strategy and objectives. Shifts in processes. Changes in employees. New ones come into the organization. They change roles in the organization. They exit the organization. And change in technology that introduce new risks. But the modern organization isn't defined by brick and mortar walls and traditional employees. The modern organization is the extended enterprise. The modern organization is a web of relationships. Suppliers, vendors, outsourcers, service providers, contractors, consultants, and more. And we have to not only manage risks within our traditional brick and mortar business, but across these extended business relationships as well. The challenge with navigating chaos is we have to keep all this change in sync. We have to keep up with regulatory change, risk change, and business change, and make sure that they're all in sync and working together. We can put a lot of time and effort into understanding regulations, but that doesn't make us compliant if that employee just came in and wasn't trained properly, or didn't read the policy, or that process or technology changed and a control wasn't implemented. You're all of a sudden non-compliant. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are about the law, if you're not keeping up, with all those changes in sync with the business itself. We have to keep all that change in sync, which requires what we'll talk about in a bit, business integrated GRC. But trying to do all this in the traditional old way of doing it, with lots of documents, spreadsheets, and emails, leads to what I call the inevitability of failure. Where you've got a mountain of documents, spreadsheets, emails. I was talking to one organization when they were going into an RFP for technology in this space, they found with an internal study that 80% of their staff time in risk, compliance, audit, and security, 80% of their staff time was managing documents and chasing documents and not managing improving risk. A lot of wasted time and effort. Another organization I was talking to, 
found out that they're spending 200 hours to build a report for the board of directors on all the risk events to find out that they had risk issues that were escalating out of control that started 11 months ago. Because they had no real-time insight into risk in their environment because it's all trapped in all these documents, spreadsheets, and emails. It took 200 hours to build a report to be able to see the complexities of these relationships. We've got to do something about this. Governance, risk, and compliance in a lot of organizations reminds me of the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California. I'm pretty sure most of you probably haven't been to that. I actually haven't been to it. I've walked by it. But the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California is a sprawling mansion that was built in the 1800s. It cost $5.5 million to build then. You calculate inflation, and that's one very expensive house today. It took 38 years to build, had 147 different builders, but it had no design, no blueprint, no architect. At the end of the day, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It, got, it has doors that opens to 20 foot drops or to walls, staircases that go up or down to nowhere, skylights that are on floors instead of ceilings. It doesn't make sense. But that's a lot of your organization's governance, risk, and compliance programs. After the last 38 years, you had a lot of different departments building GRC within the little silos and stove pipes. IT security makes it look like this. You know, enterprise risk is looking like this. Corporate compliance and ethics is approached this. And all of a sudden, you've got a maze of different processes and systems that don't integrate or cooperate, and they really don't support the business. They actually tax the business. We need to do something different. We need to architect and look at governance, risk, and compliance, or what today we're calling GPRC, governance, performance, risk, and compliance, differently and be able to integrate it and bake it into the business itself. We need to be able to see the tree as well as the forest. That individual risk as well as the interconnectedness of risks within our organizations. It's absolutely critical and essential that we be able to see the full perspective of risk and risk relationships. Risk is interconnected and interdependent. What starts off with COVID-19 as a health and safety risk is one example. Cascades like a set of dominoes into other risks, such as IT security risk in the work from home environment, privacy risk in the work from home environment, increased risk of fraud, increased risk of bribery and corruption, increased risk of modern slavery. All these different themes impact the organization in different ways. It's an integrated risk environment, what COVID-19 illustrated to us. We need to be able to see the tree, what might be a health and safety risk, but how that cascades and unfolds into a whole forest of risks as well. And that's the complexity that we're dealing with today. Is, is keeping up on top of that. Now let's unpack the definition of GRC. The official definition of governance, risk, and compliance that's found in the OSEG GRC capability model that I helped author and contribute to is that GRC is a capability to reliably achieve objectives. So we have entity level objectives for the entire organization, we have division level objectives, department, process, project, or even asset level objectives. And so we have objectives. So GRC is a capability to reliably achieve objectives. That's the governance piece. Address uncertainty, that's risk management. ISO 31000 says that risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. ISO 31000 being the international standard of risk management. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And then the compliance piece is the act of integrity that not just complying to laws and regulations, but compliance to the values and ethics of your organization, of your culture, of the, the, the compliance to uh, the, the regulations, the contractual commitments, and so much more out there. It's about acting with integrity. So let's unpack this a little bit. Governance sets the direction and strategy for the organization who likely achieve objectives, Governance sets the context for risk management. Without context, risk management fails. We don't just wake up one day and say, I feel like doing a risk assessment. What do we do a risk assessment of? We just don't pull one out of the air. To do a risk assessment, we need context. And it starts with objectives. We like ISO 31000 definition of risk. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Those objectives gives us the context to do a risk assessment within. Risk management seeks to manage and understand uncertainty to, by identification, assessment, and monitoring of risk within context to 
act on risk through risk acceptance, where we accept the risk as it is. Risk avoidance, if that's our option, to be able to avoid the risk where there's no longer a risk. Risk transfer, like through hedging and insurance and derivatives. Or the one we focus on a lot of times is risk mitigation. We have our inherent risk in our heat map, we implement these controls, and it brings us down to this residual risk, which is we find acceptable and we sign off on it. That's our risk assessment. Now, if we do this risk assessment and we have this inherent risk and we say we need control A, control B, and control C to get to this residual risk level, well, when we walk away from that risk assessment, who says that, that those three controls, A, B, and C, were ever actually implemented in the environment? We need to make sure that compliance is there as a control function to go out and validate that those controls that we've identified need to be in place to manage that risk and mitigate it to an acceptable level are actually in place and operational. So compliance aims to see that the organization acts with integrity in fulfilling its regulatory, contractual, and self-imposed of obligations and values. Compliance follows through on risk treatment plans to ensure that risk is being managed within limits and controls are in place and functioning. So as you can see here, it's like three legs to a stool. You take away one leg and things are unstable. Governance, risk, and compliance all provide stability to a stool. And what we're talking about today with GPRC is adding that performance in there because we have our objectives. How do we measure against the performance of those objectives and, and show that the organization is performing? Because this all provides then four legs to a stool that even provides more stability. But this requires that as we approach GRC, that we have this collaborative effort across the organization. That different departments and functions are working together collaboratively within the organization to achieve governance, risk, and compliance in an integrated fashion that supports performance. So as an analyst in my research, I'm monitoring five critical trends in 2023. And those trends are agility, resilience, integrity, accountability, and engagement. We'll start with agility. Agility is the ability to navigate our environment, to be able to see what's coming at us. If I'm running down the street and I see a pothole, a curb, some type of obstacle, Agility is the, the ability to see that and leap over it or go around it. Organizations today are telling me that they need risk agility. We need to be able to see what's coming at the organization from geopolitical risk to economic risk to shifts in technology and all this, and be able to go through scenarios of risk assessment analysis to understand how that's going to impact performance and objectives so they can navigate the envir environment so that we can mitigate risk exposure and capitalize on greater performance for the organization. Organizations need risk agility, but they also need resilience. Resilience has been critical the last three to four years with COVID-19, followed by the war in Ukraine and, Euro, uh, and, and uh, geopolitical risk tensions uh, and economic risk tensions. Resilience is the ability to recover from a risk event. You know, if I'm running down that path or that street again and I trip over something, Resilience is how quickly can I get back up and start running again? Risk events will happen. We need risk agility to be able to see what's coming at us and navigate the environment so we can avoid risk events. We also need to prepare the organization to be resilient so that when a risk event happens, we can recover with minimal damage and exposure to the organization. These are very symbiotic. You know, where agility is the ability to move quickly and easily to navigate the environment, while resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from an event. To be agile and resilient with risk also requires we have creative risk thinking. That we, should call traditional risk management, thought thinks a lot with the left brain. You know, that logical and structured thinking about risk. Uh, and in that context, we have our risk models. And, and they might be qualitative models, they might be quantitative models. Maybe we're using Monte Carlo analysis and stuff. Uh, and we build our risk models out there. And it's our logical and structured thinking about risk management. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes series, stated, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has facts or data. Insensibly, one begins to twist theories to suit, uh, to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. We, we need structured thinking about risk. That's not going away. And, and we've had that for generations, for like decades now on our risk thinking. 
We've had logical, structured risk models. That's still important. But again, we're navigating chaos. We have a chaotic risk environment. Risk is continuously changing. And there's so many variables. The problem with models is they're never completely accurate. They represent the real world, but models often break. We need to introduce more and more creative right-brain thinking on risk. The, 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 and in that the imagined thing about risk, if left-brain thinking is about thinking inside the box, like a model, right-brain thinking on risk is the outside-the-box thinking, the creative imagined thinking on risk. Alvin Poplar said, you can use all the quantitative data you can get, but you still have to distrust it and use your own intelligence and judgment. Who's right, Alvin Toffler or Sarah Cohen Doyle? I say both are right. Good risk management means engaging both the left brain and the right brain so we can be agile in our risk management as well as resilient as well. <coughs> the third key trend is ESG, integrity of the organization, environmental social governance. This is a global focus right now, and I'm getting interaction on this from around the world. How do we focus and improve our commitment to the environment in its many different layers and ways? Air, water, waste, pollution, uh, climate change, and so forth. How do we deal with uh, our social impact and in looking at things like privacy, uh, modern slavery issues, and things like that? And then how do we also look at the governance aspect, the, the G, which we get into uh, areas of internal control, information security, anti-fraud, anti-bribery and corruption. ESG is a huge focus and impact on organizations around the world. And we're seeing a lot of legislation and regulation around the world. In the, in the United States, the SEC has their climate change uh, disclosure rules uh, with the level three requiring you to impact, you know, report on climate change across your whole supply chain as well. Uh, you've got a lot going on in Europe and the UK on ESG reporting. You've got Germany's Corporation Supply Chain Due Diligence Act and the corresponding EU directive that's required every member country of the EU to pass similar legislation to Germany's, which is absolutely significant, as requires ongoing continuous due diligence across your supply chain and vendor relationships down to the nth level to, uh, on their ESG commitments. As significant penalties to that. So you might not even have operations in Germany, but if you are part of a German supply chain and contractual relationship, it's going to impact you. And it, it, as that goes into the other EU countries, it's going to even have bigger global impact. There's a lot of focus on the integrity of the organization. That what you communicate are your values, from the code of conduct and ethics of your organization to the regulatory commitments. That what you communicate are your values and ethics and commitments is a reality in the organization, and not just pretend. That's moving to a greater era of accountability. It's not just about risk and compliance responsibilities. Responsibilities I can outsource. I can give other people responsibilities. I can give people tasks to do. Accountability means I own this. If there's an issue, I have to step up and answer. We're seeing a huge focus on governance, risk, and compliance accountability around the world. That there's people that actually have to own this, and if it fails or there's an issue, they've got to answer to it. It's not just responsibilities that can be passed around the organization. It's becoming accountability. And then the fifth one is engagement. How do we engage all levels of the organization? From senior executives in the board, to operational and middle management, to frontline employees. As we heard in the session before me, the three lines model formerly three lines of defense. You've got that role of audit providing assurance. You've got the second line function of risk and compliance that manages and monitors risk. But now we need to really focus on that first line, that engagement out there from senior executives and all the you know, operational management and frontline employees, because risk happens on the edge of the organization. Compliance happens on the edge of the organization. It can't, it's not just a back office function, it's a front office function as well. We need better engagement. All this leads to developing a strong culture of risk management in your organization, a strong culture of compliance and ethics management in your organization. The Institute of Risk Management in London that I'm part of, I'm one of their global ambassadors of risk, we've developed the risk culture resources for practitioners guidance. We did this about a decade ago, but it applies so well today. That the attitudes that are happening out there 
within senior executives, operational management, the attitudes of frontlines and employees, that actually shapes the behavior of your organization. That behavior then forms the culture of the organization, which has a symbiotic relationship that can further influence other attitudes and behavior. The challenge with a risk culture in your organization or a compliance culture in your organization is that it can be destroyed overnight. The wrong risk decision, a bad character doing something wrong or inadvertently can completely corrupt and destroy culture instantly. It can take years or decades to repair culture. Culture is one of our greatest assets. As we look to GPRC, we need to nurture the correct culture within our organization. So we're aiming for agile and cognitive governance, risk, and compliance, or what our uh, session today is calling GPRC. Where we're more aware of this integrated risk environment and how these risks intersect with each other, the tree and the forest, we can align our different departments and functions to work together to see these relationships and collaborate. We can be more responsive to developing risk scenarios and events. That makes us more agile with risk uh, um, management to be able to navigate the environment which then improves our ability to be resilient when a risk event does happen to recover from it. And doing so with strategy, process, and technology that makes it more efficient in our use of human capital and financial capital resources. So with that, that's the conclusion of part one of my keynote. I am gonna step aside here and we're gonna have uh, five minutes uh, with, one, um, with the next that uh, Jesse will introduce. And uh, we'll, I'll continue with the second part of the keynote in just a few minutes.